Hi everyone, Pat Bellavo here with Greg Bush. Uh, this is video number five, four, five for us, five. just the two of us. Video seven in this series, the, of the two of us doing this video series. This is video number five of just he and I. Um, and we're gonna get let, continue where we left off uh, at the end of video four. And I think, if my memory serves me correctly, what we've discussed, we are going to go to Hamilton. For this Hamilton, <laughs> Ontario, Mohawk College, McMaster University. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, okay. because and after I left, uh, <clears throat> after I left Calgary and went to Red Deer from Red Deer, well, in between Red Deer and Hamilton, I was at, at Montreal doing my uh, master's degree. And for the this record, this is November twenty second, twenty twenty. That's right. Just putting that uh, putting that out there. Okay. Not a whole lot to uh, to tell about the time at McGill. A couple of stories uh, because there was a Calgary contingency there. Derek Paul was there, Dave Watts, Dustin Martine. You know they were all there doing yeah. starting your undergrad. Dustin, when I was Dustin there. Smith, Martine, Van Galen for the Calgary folk that are watching. Maybe you know those names. Yes, and Dave Watts, and then Dave uh, Watts is still there. He is still there, mm -hmm. and I don't know where um, um, Derek Paul where he yeah, is right? i i assume he's still there too i don't know for sure but we had a lot of fun but uh, n nothing of uh of uh great import comes to mind other than the time dustin and i uh because dustin is by i don't know if he still is i don't know what kind of a francophone uh population there is in in uh in halifax but dustin did french immersion <clears throat> and could speak french quite well and understand it quite well absolutely no accent though right it's a completely <laughs> from accent so dustin and i were at a corner store i don't know what do you think pat do we leave this that story in there <laughs> uh, it's there now i'm not pushing stop so <laughs> <laughs> you know speak speaking of um why look at me go moving around like look at that wow hello there okay yeah. we're back yeah, my, we, mine froze. Did yours freeze? Yeah, oh, yeah, you're fr and you're frozen again. Actually, oh, there you are. You're not, you're not frozen yeah. anymore. My internet connection is unstable. It's telling me now. Oh, geez. the hell is that? No, yeah. it isn't. It's, I've never seen that before. Anyway, yeah. um, I was going to mention <laughs> kind of along those, not the nudist part of it, but part <laughs> uh, along the uh, John Cage, uh, you know, artistic thing, made me think of a of a gig that I did probably four or five years ago, maybe something like that, at the Glenbow Museum Theater here in Calgary. Remember that? Uh, I do. That venue. Uh, there was a guy, I play in a group that Victor Coelho, Dr. Victor Coelho at Boston University, used to be here. He was, was my music history prof the second semester of my first year. So that would have been January of 1986. And uh, mm -hmm. he, we play, he put a band together called the Rooster Blues Band. And... Um, when he comes to town, we still do gigs, actually. Um, oh, one cool. of the, yeah, the guy that used to be the piano player who passed away uh, from cancer a, a few years ago was a fellow from the art department uh, named Paul Woodrow. He's originally from Leeds, UK. And one of the things that he did as, a, as a, 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 an art thang was he took a fish tank and he painted um, lines and spaces across it, like uh, music notation paper. And with a with a treble clef, and <clears throat> loaded it up with water and put fish in it. So we did this gig where it was a sax quartet, and each of us was to zero in on one particular fish, and we were supposed to follow that fish wherever it swims and play the notes <laughs> that it goes, whether it's the note, whether it's the lines of spaces, and play the notes that it's swimming by. So that's. Uh, that's what we did as a as a uh, sax quartet. We just picked our whatever fish we wanted and just played whatever notes that came out based on where the fish was swimming. That's deep, so, man. It was interesting. It was interesting. Yeah, it's not something that uh, you know you want to curl up in front of the fireplace with a <laughs> bottle of wine and, and stick on or anything like that. But, you know, the, the concept was interesting. <laughs> well, it's like I tell students, you know, when we're uh doesn't matter what age the students are it's more noticeable when it's a community band because you only practice once a week right and they're not always practicing their horns through the week <clears throat> so of course in terms of how memory works and having the stuff sink in 
So if you're doing a community band once a week, chances are you're going to have to spend 10 weeks learning the tune. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration, probably three to five weeks as before it starts to sink in, right? And they remember it. I'm like, it's the goldfish syndrome. And they're like, what? And because uh, I read, read somewhere that the goldfish has a memory of like, I don't know, three seconds or something. And I said, well, you know, the goldfish is swimming around in the aquarium. And I said, you know, and a lot of these aquariums have little, they have little fake plants or real plants, little ornaments. And if the goldfish swims around and goes, oh, look, a castle. Comes around again and goes, oh, look, a castle. Comes around again and goes, oh, for Pete's sake, there's a castle there. It comes around again, of course, they're, you know, so that goldfish or those fish that you were, <laughs> you know, it's quite possible that they had forgotten where they went and they're going to come back and do it again, which would mean you didn't have, there was no need for a repeat sign. So <laughs> they're just doing it on their own. <laughs> this is, this, this is going to, this is going to maybe be a bit of a stretch for some people, but you, the whole, oh, there's a castle. Oh, there's a castle. Oh, there's a castle thing. Reminded me of that family guy with James Woods where he's walking along going, oh, piece of candy. A piece of candy. A piece of candy. A piece of candy. <laughs> I used to pull that one on the students at school. Actually, I mentioned to you just before doing this, I had a Nanaimo International Jazz Festival Association meeting. Uh, we're trying to do a virtual festival, and one of the board members, it's a former student at VIU graduate, lovely young woman, very good singers, played the saxophone, piano, stuff like that. Good choice. And, uh, you know, my keychain has a has a little figure of uh, Peter Griffin on it, you know, so they know I'm, they know I'm a family guy fan. So what she did on the concert, she put a couple of pieces of candy down by the bottom of my music stand, because when I would be done with the piece, I'd the score, I'd put the score down you know, take it off the stand so that sure. I track of stuff, you know, and it didn't, re she was so disappointed. It didn't register. I'm, I'm looking at <laughs> what the frick is that candy doing? <laughs> so finally in the intermission or something, she's like, Greg, you didn't notice the candy. I was like, I did. And she's like, but you're not catching it. Oh, look, <laughs> candy. I was like, yeah, now I get it. Out of context. <laughs> she was a little disappointed, but then happy that I got it. Uh, at Ooh, the end. Well, you know, Ooh, piece of candy. <laughs> telling that story about doing that reminded me of the uh, of uh, the piece that uh, you and I participated in. One of my uh, oh most, yes, the one classic. Of my, well, one of there's my two classics. Prized, one of my most prized compositions. Mm -hmm. right? Homage yes. à René Lévesque. Yes, and also uh, the the what is it uh, fugue for what is it uh, flute guitar and cocktail party or whatever it was that you did piece well. for flute guitar and cocktail party absolutely yes. i so think you should explain those come on <laughs> well the, mo <laughs> the motivation well, keep in mind that this is a long time ago and back when it they was. used to call it call it 20th century composition i don't know what they call it now maybe 21st century composition but it's different and of course in the uh, this would have been in the mid 80s and it was all about, you know, trying to find your own sound and have your own unique voice and stuff. So, yeah, it was like mentioning John Cage and chance music and all the rest of that bullshit, you know. Well, one of my composition teachers there, Dr. Doolittle, who, who I believe didn't talk to the animals, mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a piece called Charlie the Chicken. Uh, no, 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 that's Charlie. Uh, was it Charlie the Chicken? Yeah, Charlie the Chicken. It was like a short opera. And then he also wrote a piece for tuba and tap dancer. So that was my motivation to write a piece for flute, guitar, and cocktail uh, cocktail uh, party. The idea being that, you know, musicians call it wallpaper jazz when you're playing for an event like that and not really anybody's listening. So I, I wrote, uh, I guess I wrote some lines and some chords for the guitar and stuff, some lines for the flute. And then I had two or three people, you know, holding their, their, their plates and their glasses and stuff and tinkling the sounds and, mm -hmm. and, and chatting and stuff like that. And, and that was the concert. That was the piece. I think I got an A on that. And then the uh, atonal fugue was funny because uh, I'd never written a fugue in, in my life to this day. I still haven't. They're hard. You had to really understand counterpoint and all that shit. So it was a two-part fugue. A tonal fugue. I was like, whatever. <clears throat> and I'm, you know, trying to use my ears to do this. And it was our mutual friend, Win Gogol, who said to me, he was an undergrad at the time. He's like, man, he says, you're taking this way too seriously. Just write some stuff. 
I mean, I had the, my waste basket in my room was overflowing with crumpled. I'm like writing, you know, I'm playing the piano and trumpet writing and that doesn't work, you know, and the <laughs> waste basket's overflowing. And by now I'm at school. Class was in the afternoon and, and I think I saw Win in the morning. I was working on it. He's like, you're taking this too seriously, man. He says, just write some stuff down. He says, just go for it. I was like, well, at this point I have to. So I just, you know, didn't even use my, I was probably listening to the radio while I was doing it. And I just wrote two two lines, you know, for you were available to to play it, so I wrote it for trumpet and Barry Sachs. And if you remember, we were having a hard time reading through it because we kept stopping and laughing. Mm-hmm. But anyway, we got through it. We got it to the point where we could play it and not laugh. And you came to the class and we played it together, didn't we? Yes. And I, the I also the, played on the Rene Levesque, Rene Levesque though too. I remember. I'm pretty sure you and Jack Shepard, I think, did play trombone, and and I played. I think, was, I, think I, the, I think the homage for Rennie Levesque was just you and me. Was it? Okay, I, I'm, so. I must be getting it uh, screwed up with something else. That. Yeah, I remember Jack Shepard being involved. On yeah, because we we played together. It was something you wrote. I know that. Maybe and it, it was three. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, know what the I other think, one was then. I think it was two, but yeah, Jack Shepard did something too. So. Um, <laughs> anyway, we got through it without laughing. And there's the teacher looking at the score going, yep, a tonal fugue. Yep, a tonal fugue. I got an A. Mm-hmm. And then I remember telling that to my uh, master's advisor, who shall also remain nameless. I was telling him, I was like, ask me how honest I felt doing that. Mm-hmm. And you how know? happy you are with the end result. <laughs> and I said, not proud of it. I said, but I pulled the wool over the teacher's eyes. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, I'm not responsible. I can't, I'm not responsible, nor can I comment on the actions of my colleague, colleagues. So I'm paraphrasing, but something to that effect. And I was thinking, yeah, no shit. He's not going to say anything. <laughs> these people. I was like, yeah, pull the wool over my eyes. And in hindsight, I pulled the wool over his eyes, too, because I had to write some kind of piece for percussion. And um, Star Spangled and I, Pizza. <laughs> and when it uh, it looked pretty good on the score. And then I remember many years later, because I it, the piece was never performed. I think I got an A on that, too. <clears throat> it was a piece in three movements for percussion. And then when the uh, finale presented itself, you know, the software notation software program, I started to input it into finale and I got about 16 bars in and I was like, okay, I want to listen to this and listen to what it sounds like. And it sounded like shit. It sounded awful. It was ridiculous. So I scrapped that assignment. I was like, the hell with that. You know, <clears throat> I was like, well, it's good to know I got an A on something that didn't sound good, but uh, whatever. I, I also like- remember a conversation that you had with a, <clears throat> with a professor who again, will remain nameless who we both know um, that, um, talking about composers and, and well, in this situation too, how many times have you played Renny Levesque or uh, flute guitar and cocktail party since you wrote them? <laughs> exactly. you know, so there was this, this, this argument or whatever discussion, shall we say, <laughs> happened that uh, about, um, um, you, know, a, you know, sometimes a composition, seems like a lot of times, you, will be played once and then shelved. It'll never be played again. And, and then I think you said, well, you know, you look at somebody uh, like, for example, David Foster, you brought him up, I think, and he said, oh, wait, David Foster's a songwriter, not a composer. And I think you said, oh, I want to be a songwriter then because I don't want to write songs to be played once and then thrown on the shelves forever. That's I agree. Right. That's right. I'd rather be a songwriter too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Me too. I would rather write something, get it recorded and have, have it being played everywhere. Yeah, totally. You know, yeah. sorry. That's well, just, I'm not that sorry, but, but I'm not those, that sorry. Along those lines, I, I could say that I'm almost a one-hit wonder. Oh, excellent. The piece was played once, and that was it. <laughs> That's true. Yes, there well, you, you know, go. You can, you can go to the uh, Canadian Music Center, uh, and the only one I've ever been to is the one in, um, in Calgary. I used to be at the top floor of the library at the university. I don't know if it still is. And I would browse around, you know, because I was I'm I love browsing around the libraries. It's fun. Times have changed a little bit, <clears throat> and uh, I'd look at all of those pieces up there, and many of them were only performed once, if at all. 
one of my colleagues at McMaster University showed me his PhD composition for, I think it was for a full orchestra. I forget how long it was, the PhD. He showed it to me. And I was, I'm looking at the score. And of course, it was meticulously copied by hand long before music notation software. Mm -hmm. And I was like, far out, man. I was like, so is there a recording of it somewhere and I could listen to it too? And he's like, no, it was never performed. I was like, excuse me, like never performed. He's like, never performed. And I said, you got your PhD on the strength of a piece of music that was never performed. He's like, yep. See, to like, me, well, you're going to spend all that time meticulously copying and, and putting out the thought process and all that stuff for it to never be performed or recorded is criminal. I know. That's ridiculous. But this was the same cat had that had figured out that his there's, there's two times two times that people were were close to calling 911 because they thought greg was going to like expire from laughing so hard uh one the first time one of the times was listening to the jerky boys and i forget whose car that was don't forget george wallace in your basement with me and john dewall three times then. there you go <laughs> i'll remind might, you of that it might have been tony cox's car that we were okay. in listening to the jerky boys. I don't think you were there. No, I don't remember that. You don't remember that? I think well, Lasko was there and Billy. And uh, oh man, I was just dying, I was laughing so hard. Anyway, this colleague at uh, McMaster had a uh, the large size poodle. What are they called? Stan is that the standard poodle? Anyway, I don't, I don't and he determined that the dog howled at a couple of pitches. And it seems to me the dog howled at and he, he figured it out that it was an A-flat, somewhere in the vicinity of an A-flat and a B. And he sits down at the piano and he starts playing the blues in A-flat or whichever, maybe F, I don't know. So the A-flat and the B are the blues notes, right? So he's playing a phrase in the piano. Clearly he's laying it down. It's definitely a blues, you can tell. And the dog owls on the right sounds. <laughs> and then he plays a bit more in the dog. I, this is in their house, of course. He's a grand piano. And I'm fucking dying. I'm like gasping for, for air. And his wife's reaching for the phone. She thinks she's going to have to call the ambulance to come and resuscitate me. Finally, he had to like tone it down to, to give me a chance to catch my breath. And, uh, and I'm like, dude, you got to call America's funniest videos, man, and submit this. I said, you win the freaking pro. Oh. He's like, oh, no, I could never do that. Very private guy. Could never do that. You know? <clears throat> and his oh, wife. Oh, I would have done it at a drop of a hat. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and his uh, wife was uh, Lauren's uh, piano teacher. Yeah. It's yeah. funny where the inspiration comes up, you know, and who knows. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny listening to the dog sing the blues, man. Mm -hmm. Too funny. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, there were a lot of fun times in um, <clears throat> in Ontario and Hamilton. And uh, I have a lot of fun memories of that place, as I do of Calgary, because, of course, Calgary and Alberta being there 12 or 14 years, making friends with you and John DeWall and those cats and <clears throat> playing so many gigs. Um, Lots of good memories about that. And then continuing, um, not that I don't have good memories here, but they're just different because they're <clears throat> because of the, the, the time frame and just the environment here, the size of the, of the place. Um, not as many opportunities to go play gigs and shit. Mm -hmm. And yet so much fun happens on the hang, right? So. <laughs> well, I remember doing, um, doing gigs with uh, Tyler Hornby's dad's band, Mark Hornby's band. We would after we were done, we'd go to well, there used to be El Combo House, but at 17th Avenue and Fourth Street, Southwest. Right. We would we would go have like a sandwich or something after be out till three or four in the morning. <laughs> after a gig, God, I I could never do that now. I would be I'd be almost dying by the last set. I think now. Yeah. I'd be like, oh man, I can't hang. I, I'll barely get home. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But I of course, I was in my twenties back then. So it was nothing. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I can't hang the way I used to. No, me I, neither. I want to, but then I pay for it the next day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same with me. <laughs> and I, I have to make sure I can sleep until noon anyway. That's true. If I'm going to do that, I have to prepare for it. You know. 
and people ask me, they're like, how come musicians are so funny? I'm like, it's because we we spend so much time in a small room all by ourselves playing, you know, practicing that when we get out and, and play gigs and, and hang and stuff like that, just want to laugh and kibitz and, and shoot mm-hmm. the shit and have fun, you know? Um, well, yeah, I, I can't imagine hanging out till four now. Four o'clock is about when I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine I'd just be getting home at that point. <laughs> Jeez. That's true. Was, right. Wasn't it you that told me that somebody that you knew or heard of wrote a master's thesis on the importance of the hang? Oh, I don't think that was me. Okay. Somebody somebody I spoke to, and I can't think of who it is, hmm. knew somebody or, or uh, <clears throat> there was a master's thesis written on uh, – at uh, one of the jazz programs, like a jazz masters, the importance of the hang, the, the post gig hang. Oh, because it's a thing. So it is. Yeah. Yeah. So Definitely. I don't know how that went or anything, but I thought it was you that mentioned that. That's... No, no. Well, if you if you track it down, I I would yeah. uh, I would love to read it. I'm, I'm sure it's interesting. I wouldn't know where to look, but yeah, maybe. Well, well, I don't yeah. have, don't I, not like I don't have time to look things up. You know, it's not like there's a lot of gigs happening right now. Yeah. No et cetera. Et cetera. <clears throat> And that's what I miss too about the fact that there's not as many gigs as there used to be as the hang, you know, but um, <clears throat> for me anyway, in the environment where I am, the hang is like after the rehearsal, you know, playing in rehearsal bands and stuff, we would still go mm-hmm. hang afterwards. And uh, <clears throat> when the COVID shit hit the fan for back in March and, and my Thursday night big band that I was rehearsing in, we had to call it quits. We started to meet every Thursday night on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Just to keep keep the connection, keep the hang going, you know. Yeah, there are other bands that I know of here that are doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We haven't done it in any of the ones that I'm in, but I know of other, either community bands or semi-pro bands or whatever that do that uh, on their regular schedule time. They get together on Zoom and, and yeah. uh, do activities and yeah. stuff or whatever. And just. And then we, we stopped for the summer because we would have stopped the band for the summer. And then we tried to resurrect it in September again. The, the timing wasn't right. It didn't feel right. There wasn't as many, uh, <clears throat> there wasn't as much interest in doing it. So we did it once or twice and kind of fizzled out. But that reminds me of, uh, of course, I, we're, we're, we're jumping all over the, <laughs> all over the map and all over the time frame. A few years ago here, I started a Gazers Club. So it was uh, 60 plus. Right? Oh, really? And it came about through, um, the various interests through this big band that was rehearsing the Aerosmith band, which on a side note. Is that an Aerosmith Aerosmith too? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Well, walk this way. (laughs) Okay. So anyway, one of the cats and we're very good friends to this day is is a music teacher, band teacher at Qualicum high school. And he's a very good tenor player and his wife's a good trumpet player and their kid is killing it on the trumpet. Oh my gosh. So anyway, when they first asked me to join the band, I was in some converse, email correspondence with him. And uh, so at one point I, I wrote and I said, is Steve Tyler the singer in the band? Joe and, Perry on guitar. And, all, <laughs> and, and his response was one word, no. <laughs> not, oh, he obviously didn't get it. Well, to this day, I'm like, did he get it, or was he busting? Uh, was he busting me right back? You I know? suspect he didn't get it, <laughs> or he's heard it so many times he's not going to answer it any other way. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So we had uh, in the big band, of course, the uh, trumpet connection, because there were people from outside outside the uh, big band that were in it. So <clears throat> two guys that were coming and hanging out uh, as mature students, as adult students in the program two retired RCMP guys that both played trumpet. So there was that connection. Uh, a bunch of them were into rebuilding sports cars or vintage cars. There was mm-hmm. that connection. A bunch of them were, oh, a bunch, a few of them were fly fishermen. So um, Dave Klinger was in on it. He was a geezer. And then the bass player, Rob Uffin, who also, he was like a triple threat because he was in the Aerosmith band. Oh, four. He was a geezer was in the Aerosmith band. He was a fly fisherman and he um, had a little sports car. He had some kind of uh, Porsche with a Volkswagen engine in it, some kind of. This engine. was completely made for him. That's right. And uh, 
yeah and th and throughout one summer we must have got together three or four times you know once every couple of weeks we'd go for lunch or go for beer somewhere and i remember telling my son david about it a little bugger and i said yeah we're meeting and we do this it's fun we shoot the shit you know have lunch have a beer or something and just hang out and uh we've been like checking out different pubs. I said, they're coming from everywhere, from Courtney to from Port Alberni, from Ladysmith, from, you know, so we kind of meet on the, on the North end of, uh, of Nanaimo. So it's not too far for everybody. He goes, well, yeah, he says, I get that. He says, but he says, don't forget. He says, you could just, you know, meet at the same place. He says, every time he says, none, none of you are going to remember. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It's all going to seem new. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I'll try and find the um, the criteria. I don't know. I was on a roll one day when I put this together. I had like a whole freaking criteria of what the, <laughs> the demands you had to meet to mm -hmm. belong to the geezer club. And then I even had criteria for geezers in training because a couple of guys were like, hey, I want to get in on this. And we're like, you're not 60 yet. You can't do it. So then we, <laughs> I came up with geezers in training and all of that shit. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then uh, we only did it the one season. They were talking about it <clears throat> the next summer and stuff. And I was like, not really feeling it. And a couple of them were like, yeah, me too. You know, it just mm -hmm. the, the timing was right. But back to david busting my chops you know um i there's a guy at school that works in the print shop and he's got a ridiculous sense of humor so anyway i ran into so we hang out you know we exchange jokes and shit so uh, i ran into him on the campus one time and he says to me he says oh hi how's it going yeah, yeah. And I was, he's like oh i met your son last night i was like i'm sorry to hear that and he completely starts to laugh, right? And I was like, yeah, let me guess. I said, you told David you knew me. And he said he was sorry to hear that. And he's like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> he's like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as they say. I was like, yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Musicians, like, uh we want to hang out and have a good time because, like I say, we spend so much time practicing in a, in a little room all by ourselves. We're so excited yeah. to get out and play. We music. need to do something to maintain sanity. Absolutely. Yeah. So, For the record, I started the, the timer late here, but we just crossed, crossed 33 minutes. So I think we're, I, I was about a minute behind before. So we're okay. probably just inching up to 35 minutes now. Well, let's stop this one and carry on again at another one so that they don't get too, too long. Okay. Does that suit you? Yeah, sure. All right. So okay, we're adjourning. Bye. We're yeah. adjourning until part two. Okay.